Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to this time and space God has created for you. As we come together in this community, may you find the spirit you are looking for. May it join you with those who are joining us. That all that we do here would praise God and give thanks for all God has done for us. Know that as you come to this place, God welcomes you. Please join me in the hymn, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer. Paul took the Jesus movement all across the Roman Empire in the first century. He brought the message of the risen Christ to people and places far away from the Jewish communities where Jesus lived and taught. People of diverse practices and backgrounds around the Mediterranean world were drawn to new communities founded by Paul. Conflicts often arose in those communities about what constituted faithful practices. Was it necessary for a Gentile follower of Jesus to first become a Jew 
and follow Jewish law? Or could a Gentile follow Jesus without first adopting a Jewish way of life? Including dietary practices and Sabbath observances. These conflicts were serious and could potentially tear communities apart. In his letter, Paul does not take a side. Instead, he encourages all in the community to keep eyes on what is important. Faithfulness to Jesus, thanksgiving to God, leaving judgment to God. Within this view, many different ways of following Jesus are possible. <clears throat> Our issues may be different in the 21st century, but Paul's process still has much to recommend it. Please join me in our call to community. Welcome those who differ, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while others eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed all. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who eat, eat in honor of Christ, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of Christ. And give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to Christ, and if we die, we die to Christ. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, to be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your family or friends? Why do you despise them? For we will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Holy One, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us is accountable to God. Brothers and sisters, we have joined as a community. We have joined our voices together to be as one people. Let us join now in our opening call to worship. Bless God, O oh friends, with all your strength, bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Bless God, O oh friends, with all your strength, bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Forgiveness flowing into healing, tireless goodness and joy, strength and youth of the eagle's flight. Bless God, O oh friends, with all your strength. Bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. Vindication, justice for all those oppressed, liberation from bondage and guidance for the way, unending mercy, steadfast love. Bless God, O oh friends, with all our strength, bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's love toward those who are faithful. As a parent has compassion for children, so God has compassion for us. Bless God, O oh friends, with all our strength, bless the holy name. Bless God, O oh friends, and never forget God's gifts. We have come together as community. We have joined together in our call to worship and come to God. Let us now join in our prayer of invocation. Compassionate one, lover of goodness, patience with sinners, draw near to us. Surround us with confidence in your good news. 
that you love us as a parent loves their children. That your mercy is boundless and generous. That you beckon us always and will wait forever as we find our way back to you. Open our hearts to receive your compassion and then show us how to forgive so that we may be vessels of resurrection hope in our troubled world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, in the scripture, seven is often seen as a perfect number, a mystical number, a number that points to infinity. So when Jesus tells his disciples to forgive 70, seven times, or 70 times seven, he is inviting people into a never ending, expansive dance of grace. Confession, repentance, turning one's life around to a transformed future. Forgiveness, resilience, opening one's life to a new moment in a relationship. All this may seem impossible, and yet Jesus calls us to profound, ever-evolving change. Let us take a few moments to ponder our lives, personal and in wider community. Where do we forg need forgiveness? Where do we need to forgive? Where do our lives intersect in the wider community with structures, practices, attitudes that deeply hurt our neighbors? Where must we seek forgiveness? Where must we seek to affect change? How have we been wounded with structures, practices, attitudes of the wider community that need transformation. How may we begin to forgive? Let us join in silent reflection, asking God's forgiveness and strength. Brothers and sisters, we have come and confessed. Now let us join our voices together, united in our assurance of pardon. Holy One, you call us into this ever-expanding dance of grace. Turning 70 times 7 is not too much when we follow your lead into a future of hope and peace. Glory be to the one who working in us can do infinitely more than we ask or imagine. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. All those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. 
Why do you pass judgment on your brothers or sisters? Or do you... Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Our first Meditation this morning is entitled, Make Up Your Mind, But. When I was in seminary, I had a teacher that told me that anytime there was a comma but in a sentence, whatever followed the but was what we truly believed. And anything that came before that was just our agreeing with people in order to stop a fight. And there's some good truth to that statement. Think about it. I really like that dress, but. You've got a great singing voice, but. And whatever comes after is what we truly think. You've got a great singing voice, but you couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I really like that dress, but I wish it were pink rather than blue. what we really think comes after. And I want to make very clear that this is what I intend for the title. Make up your mind, but. It's what comes after the but that's important. As we grow in our faith, we find new ways of understanding things. And especially in this time in, that we're in, where everybody has an opinion and everybody's opinion is important, and it is. But that belongs to you, and you have every right to your opinion. And nobody has the right to tell you what your opinion should be. And yet, there's another side to that. That also means you don't have the right to tell others what their opinion should be. And we see that a lot right now. Everybody wants you to believe like them. And it's hard to actually buy into a lot of what's being said, no matter where you sit. And it's difficult. And Jesus didn't want that. It wasn't a divisive thing that Jesus came to have, but a uniting to be one mind with God. To do what was good and holy. To look at how God had dealt with the world and realize that even though we did wrong, God still chose to love. Still chose to take us in. To be a part of our world. To continue to bless and to love. Imagine how different the world would be if that were not the case. So make up your mind, but leave room for transformation and change. Leave room for people to come in and converse and have dialogue. And that's one of the places we are missing out greatly right now as a nation and as a world. There's not dialogue. There's my opinion, and there's your opinion. Mine's right, yours is wrong. And I'm going to prove to you why yours is wrong. As Paul is talking to the early church, it is sitting in the same types of positions. As I said earlier, they were trying to figure out, okay, if I want to be a Christian, does that mean I have to learn to be a Jew first and take on that faith and then follow Jesus? And that would make me a good Christian? Do I have to follow their dietary laws? Do I have to follow their rules and then I can be a Christian? Or can I be a Christian without doing all of that? And it's still okay. And they were very divided on this whole idea. 
okay, I can eat pork, I can't eat pork, I can do this, I can't do that. And if you did it, you were shunned from the church. If you didn't do it, you were shunned by the new people, and they were divided. And Paul comes in and says, it doesn't matter whether you abstain or whether you don't. But make up your mind to follow God. So make up your mind about what you believe, but make a vow to yourself to allow God to come in and transform your world, to change who you are, and to do it through conversation and dialogue with others through learning about what's important and through showing love. The other side of any argument always thinks that those who are against are weak. And you can see that now, right? All the arguments that are going on as to whether to open or not open, whether to wear a mask or not wear a mask, whether to have this practice or not have this practice, do we shake hands or not shake hands? Do we start school up or do we not start school up? Is there a right or a wrong answer? We don't know. That's the answer. We don't know. And we can place our faith in God but our faith is in the God that we've experienced, in the God that we see. And the God that we see throughout Scripture is one who protects, is one who loves, is one who cares, but is also one that allows us to fall on our face with folly, also allows us to make our own choices and turn away, also allows us to be foolish and have to learn the hard way. So, where is the right answer? The right answer lies in the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We need to make up our minds to love the people around us, regardless of where they stand. They may not agree with us. That's okay. How boring the world would be if we all thought the same way. If we all did the same things. We'd never experience something new. We'd never see change or transformation. We'd never see growth. God has changed and transformed the world and the church for millennia and done it through people like you and I. People who made up their minds to love God and love neighbor have transformed the world. It's not about how we feel or what our opinion is, but can we be truly loving? And what does love entail? The grace of God. Blessing people beyond what they deserve. The love of God. looking past what you see on the outside and seeing the potential of who a person could be. The forgiveness of God. To wipe the board clean and start anew and to journey with the people as they repent. As they turn around 
and go another direction. And I dare say, the ability of God to adapt and to meet us where we are at, regardless of where that is. so important that if we are going to love neighbor, we need to come to where they are and not judge. We need to be willing to forgive even when it's not deserved. We need to be abundant with our gifts and blessings even when we are positive that they will not be honored and cherished and used the way we would like them to be. So I tell you today, make up your mind, have your opinion, but place your love in God, your faith in God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Please join me in the hymn, If I Have Been a Source of gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may, not, may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe me. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. 
When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here ends the reading of God's word. May it have rich blessings. Forgive as you have been forgiven. We just talked about the change and transformation that needs to happen. Loving one's neighbor and loving God. But in order to get there, there's something we need to do first. And that's to begin the healing process. To begin to have these hurts that are out there soothed and cared for. And part of that comes through forgiving others. And I need you to understand something. When you hold a grudge against someone else, it's not hurting them, but instead weighing you down. When you are unable to forgive another, It weighs down your spirit. It holds you in a place that doesn't allow you to heal. And it holds them in a place where they can't come to you to resolve the issue either. To forgive as we've been forgiven. So often we're forgiven before we even ask. The forgiveness happened long before we even came to God and said, I'm sorry. I need your help. I was wrong. Our God is so wise. that there is no way we could possibly understand fully what that forgiveness takes. And our God has forgiven so much more than the petty things that we tend to hold against others. Those things that weigh on our hearts, words that have been said, attitudes that have been held, actions that have hurt us. And our hearts can't begin to heal because we can't begin to forgive. And we're there. And I'm afraid that it's going to continue to get worse before it begins to get better. Because our world isn't a place that forgives very easily. We hold on to things and wrongs and ideas much too long. We hold grudges. rather than falling on the reminder of God that we have been forgiven so much. But I'm a good person. I've tried to do right. And I've said I'm sorry. Which is true. But God calls us to love our neighbor. 
do not despise them. And I struggle with this the same way all of you do. I have a hard time forgiving people. I have a hard time letting go of the wrongs that have been done to me. Some of them are my own doing, my own perception. I think about them and wonder why it is somebody would do that to me. How could they intentionally be out to get me the way they are? Somebody will say something about an opinion I have and I immediately take offense because they're attacking me personally when all they're doing is disagreeing with my opinion. It's not who I am. But I'm holding to an ideal. An idea. Over the last few months, we've talked about gaining an identity in God. We've talked about being called by God and having a purpose through God by that calling. Being loved by God so much that we are transformed and changed and moved ahead and taken from where we were to being a servant that can transform and change others. We've talked about it through stories like that of Moses and how all that Moses had done and yet God called Moses and changed and transformed an entire people through him. We've talked about how Jesus took an entire faith background and helped to reorganize it, to change it for the better, to transform it. And how that simple act of creating communion was taking something old and transforming it into something new for us that we could understand. And it's not that the other people were wrong, but simply that we weren't able to see or agree with what they were doing, and it wasn't drawing us closer to God. So God changes and adapts to where we are at and forgives us forgives us for not being able to reconcile with one another. To see the importance of something to another. We are so passionate about our world that we forget that this life is a gift. That this world is a gift and ultimately is a very temporary Place for us. That the goal is actually eternal life with God. It, a place where there will be peace and joy and comfort and love. No longer the broken world in which we live. We will be changed and transformed to something much greater than what we have today. So we need to forgive as we've been forgiven. And it won't be easy. But we can start the process. We can be the transformation that has to take place for our world and our nation to begin to heal, to curb the violence, and to become less broken than it was when we found it, or than it's becoming right now. Now, are you going to change the entire world? Are we going to get up tomorrow morning, all kneel down and pray at 8 o'clock, and everything's going to go away? No more riots, no more killing, no more heinous acts of crime. No. But what we can do is change our attitude to allow God to work through us and change the people whom we touch. Imagine how much difference 
different the story would have been that Jesus told if the slave who had been forgiven went out and forgave his fellow slave that owed him a hundred denarii. Who knows, maybe that slave would have paid back a hundred plus. Maybe he would have never paid back. We don't know. But imagine what would happen if we had showed kindness and forgiveness and love and grace and done all that we talked about previously. And we trusted in what God tells us that our acts of good will come back to us a hundredfold. We can make the change. But it starts with making a change in attitude and in practice, in answering this call that we've been talking about, finding our purpose in God as we've been talking about, our identity in God, and not in our simple opinions and understandings of the world, and the intricate workings of how everything comes together. Paul talks to us and says, don't worry about this. Have faith in God. Realize that when somebody else does something, it is out of their faith. Trust that God is working in the people around you. And if that's the case, then they're not out to do you harm, but to do well. And as they grow they will become more forgiving. They will become transformed and changed. That's not my responsibility to change their opinion and their behavior. My responsibility is to be forgiving and loving and caring. To make the transformations that need to be made for me in order to live into the identity God has made and the potential God sees in my individual person and to see God work through that to transform an entire people. I know we feel hurt. We feel angry. We are afraid. And regardless of where you are, you are also loved, cared for, forgiven, and entrusted with a calling and an identity that God has specifically for you. But if your heart is going to start to heal, you need to forgive. You need to see through the eyes of God the potential of the people around you. Now, does that mean bad things are going to stop happening? Bad things are going to happen in this world. That is a given. How we react to them. The love and forgiveness and grace that we give in our reaction will result in the transforming change that God is trying to bring about in our world. The question becomes, will you make the change? Will you allow God to work through and in you and above all else, will you see yourself and others the way God does? As beloved creations, honoring God to the best of our abilities and understanding for where we are at today. May God bless you with sight. May he give you the strength to forgive. 
May you find acceptance in your heart and in your life for something different than yourself. And all God's people said, Amen. Please join me in the hymn, Amazing Grace. Beloved brothers and sisters, we have all been blessed by our God. We have been given gifts beyond our understanding, and we have found a God who forgives beyond anything we could imagine. And that causes us to want to offer up praise and thanksgiving to God. And I ask that we do that now, in this time of prayer. Blessed Creator, by your hand we receive not only the gifts of the Spirit, but our callings to use them. We recognize your call and know how blessed we are. In these moments of silence, as we raise our thanks and praise to you, also hear our solemn vows to give back. Make us your hands and feet in the world your still calming voice, and your gentle spirit of forgiveness. As we have called upon our Lord and made our pledges and vows, let us united with one another in voice and spirit, 
join in the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace, my friends, and join me in the hymn. O for a world. My friends, I'm glad you were able to come and join us today, that you have shared in the word, in the prayers, and in the spirit of thanksgiving and offering, that you've come and hopefully found a place to be closer to God. Now, we ask for your assistance. We ask that you continue to hold up this congregation in this community in prayer, that all that we would do would bring honor and glory to God, and that we would have the resources necessary both in people, time, and finances in order to do so. We would also ask it that you are able and willing, you would help us out by supporting us financially, by hitting the Donate Now button, and helping to continue the ministries that we have of outreach through our food pantry, through groups like our shift group that reaches out to the community with care packages for the homeless, the teens who are in need, those who reach out individually to feed the hungry, to pray for others, and for all of the other ministries that we continue to do here at the church. We thank you in advance for any gifts that you give. And we share with great abundance and joy our prayers for all of you. May you have a blessed day.